Hello to everyone joining us and welcome to this webinar. My name is Anna Chirovrier Hanson. I am in charge of business development at Sensagen and I will be your host today. Today's webinar will start with a series of recorded presentations followed by a live Q&A session. If you want to ask a question during the Q&A, please write it in the questions chat box in your control panel. This chat box is located on the right side of your screen. Now we are ready to start the webinar, but just give me a couple of seconds. So hello to everyone joining us and welcome to this webinar about the safety and efficacy evaluation of cosmetic products and ingredients. This webinar is prepared in partnership with CETRA, Gene Evolution, Laboratory Watchfrog, Picaderm, and Sensagen. In this joint webinar, we will present how innovative in vitro test methods can be integrated in the safety and efficacy evaluation strategies of cosmetic products and ingredients. The speakers are all experts in their fields and will be available to answer your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. To ask a question, please write it in the questions chat box in your control panel. The chat box is located on the right side of your screen. We are now ready to start the webinar, so let's do it. Our first speaker today is Dr. Clarisse Bavou, expert regulatory toxicologist, safety assessor, and head of cosmetics at CETRA. CETRA stands for Consultancy for Environmental and Human Toxicology and Risk Assessment. Since 2001, they provide high-quality scientific and innovative solutions, ensuring regulatory compliance of chemicals and cosmetics to international obligations. Clarisse will now introduce the regulatory requirements for cosmetic safety assessments with the perspective of innovation, new methods from research to guidance. Hi, my name is Clarisse Bavou. I'm a toxicologist and safety assessor. I'm very happy to tell you about regulatory requirements for cosmetic safety assessment. Okay, let me tell you about what the, co the European cosmetic regulations say, and also the nuts of guidance of the SSCS. First of all, the non-clinical safety studies shall comply with the GLPs, the good laboratory practices. In the nuts of guidance of the SSS, it is said that toxicity studies should be performed according to the guidelines published by the European, European Commission as methods cited for the classification, the European CLPs. Or they could be the OECD technical guidance. Of course, they should be done according to the GLPs with some possible deviations, according that it is explained and scientifically justified. Can non-validated methods be used? Yes. The SSS says that some of those methods could be also accepted if they are scientifically valid and particularly if they have sufficient amount of experimental data providing relevance and reliability, including positive and negative control. Let's take some examples of OECD validated methods, for example, for skin irritation and eye irritation. The following OECD technical guidance are published with some values, some rates for sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, they all have positive and negative controls. To remind you, the sensitivity is the true positive rate. That's the proportion of samples that are really positive and that give a positive result in that method. The specificity is the true negative rate, okay, the rate of negative uh, results among negative samples. What about all the methods in the pipeline? It is a very long process for a validation 
to obtain a technical guidance by the OECD. The ECVAM um, managed this process. The following steps are followed, the submission, the validation, the peer review, the recommendations, and the regulatory acceptance. ECVAM is the European Reference Laboratory for Alternatives to Animal Testing. Validation is really a long and complex process. You can hear here, you can see here several steps of this very complicated process that I'm not going to describe. Of uh, acute toxicity. If you search for uh, methods in uh, the, their tracker on the ECBAM website, you can identify seven results for acute toxicity. And here you can identify the several steps that are uh, followed by the by the methods. By the methods, is it are they at the beginning or at the end of the process? And you can identify that some of them are currently cited in the in the ECAS guidance on information requirements uh, for um, testing data on acute toxicity. If you look at the, the bottom of, of this slide, you can identify the stage of the validation by ECVAM. Unvalidated methods. Well, there is a huge amount of uh, research labor laboratory. They search, they find, they are published. Uh, they also promote their methods. Here, for example, an example about blue screen HC, about genotoxicity. Here, an example of a structure that, had, that can help some labs to promote their methods, such as PAPER, which is a, an organism in France for endocrine disruption. Very important to remind that OECD technical guidance is not a goal for all toxicological methods. Some of them can be used only for research or for screening. This is, this is the case, for example, for the critical endpoints, genotoxicity and skin sensitization. Examples in those two fields. Here, for example, a paper from Basketer about skin sensitizing potency, another paper about different approaches. In this paper, you can find the following table giving results about the predictivity of different methods, including the REC. You can find very relevant papers in literature about the in vitro comet assay and an, uh, a skin model, a 3D skin model that is uh, very promising. In the first, uh, uh, the, the first um, papers uh, are related to the to the to the to the in silico, in silico tool. Uh, measuring the predictivity uh, of uh, a high predictivity versus human reason. Maybe you heard about those different words. NAM, New Approaches Methodologies, ITS, Integrated Testing Strategies, DA, Defined Approaches, and GRA, Next Generation Risk Assessment. All those approaches combine several methods of course, in vitro methods, but also in silico predictions and sometimes omics such as genomics and transcriptomics. Some of them can also consider the exposure to a given substance via a cosmetic product. This is an example of a guideline for some defined approaches. My last words would be about the current context of animal testing ban. There is still a lot of scientific knowledge still needed. And any relevant and new methods must be considered to appreciate toxicity provided that it is scientifically 
justified. So please remind that one method is for one question, one scientific question, and the results must show the reliability. So now I'm going to let you uh, hear uh, uh, who are very good scientists in different fields of toxicity and I'll be happy to share uh, our views and answer your questions in the cure questions and answer session. Thank you. Thank you, Clarisse, for your presentation and introduction to today's webinar topic. Our next speaker is Francis Fino, founder and president of Gene Evolution. Gene Evolution is dedicated to in vitro genetic toxicology and toxicology expertise using new human cell models. Francis Fino has a long career with position at Sanofi and Covance, and he is an expert in the field of genotoxicity and product safety for chemicals, cosmetics, and pharmaceuticals. Francis will now present the topic of genotoxicity assessment of cosmetics. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank Sensagen's teams for giving me the floor, as well Anan, Gregory, and Clarice of Pecaderm, Watchfrog, etc. Thank you. Customers are more and more concerned about the potential toxicity of chemical, pharmaceutical, and cosmetic, including the risk of cancer. Gen Evolution is a CRO dedicated to genetic toxicology and toxicology in vitro to prevent risk of cancer. We, we are a part of Sequence Labs ecosystem in the suburb of Paris. Well, the interesting question of today is how to integrate innovative in vitro genetic toxicology method into the genetic toxicology assessment. And this presentation will be divided in different parts. And the first will be the definition of genetic toxicology. How to standardize innovative scientific techniques. So I mean, how they become methods will be used by everyone worldwide in OCDU solution. The third part will be how to validate innovative in vitro genetic toxicology methods. Then, uh, for example, of innovative method in genetic toxicology from gene evolution for carcinogen genotoxic and for non-genotoxic carcinogen in MS test, micronucleus test, and in cell transformation assay. So what is genetic toxicology? Genetic toxicology is a set of tools and techniques that predicts compound toxic to DNA and thus identify carcinogenic agent. In this slide, I would like to show genetic toxicology test, the place of genetic toxicology test in the carcinogenesis process. I mean initiation and promotion phase. The first phase involved in carcinogenesis process is involves the compounds called carcinogen, carcinogen genotoxic. This is initiation phase. In this phase, produce gene mutations, and the test to show this effect is M-test or MLA test. We have two different tests to show mut gene mutation essay, uh, effect. And we have also uh, chromosomal damage with micronucleus test. And in this test, we, sh we, show, we, we, we show clastogen effect and anogen effect. This is mutation. And on the other side, we have the second phase, promotion phase, where carcinogen non-genotoxic are produced. And uh, a, a test uh, could be show this promotion phase in vitro test is cell transformation assay. Now the question is how to standardize innovative scientific technique and to become methods that can be used by everyone worldwide 
So this is OECD solution. After the Second War, in order to preserve the peace, OECD was established. OECD is an international organization in which governments work together to find solutions to common challenges, develop global standards, share experiences, and identify best practices to promote better policy for better lives. OECD guidelines set up specific rights and obligations and may contain monitoring mechanisms. Recommendations are adopted by Council, but they are not legally binding. GLP study follow OECD guidelines. Here is a brief list of services of gen genetic toxicology tests proposed by Gen Evolutions, HEMS, chromosomal aberration, micronuclei, MLA, CTA. CTA. In this talk, we look uh, in particular the innovation in HEMS tests and for macronuclei tests and CTA. All GLP study performed in compliance must follow OECD guidelines. For CTA, only one draft directive is referenced. For all tests, they are miniaturized and there are good correlation ratio to predict GLP tests. The third question is how to validate innovative in vitro genetic toxicology method. When a proof of concept is achieved, a first validation intralaboratory is made to test compounds. For example, in genetic toxicology, we use Kirkland list in mutation research and build a database of historical data, negative controls and positive control. At the end, some examples of parameter performed is sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, positive predictivity, negative predictivity. And this kind of prediction of ratio is compared to in vitro method for uh, GLP and non-GLP method or for in vivo in vitro method. The method is transferred to another laboratory to other laboratory. This is interlaboratory validation. Now we will see example of innovative method in genetic toxicology for carcinogen genotoxics and for non-genotoxic carcinogen in MS test, macronucleus test in cell transformation essay. I think everybody knows MS test method described in OECD guideline. Professor Bruce Ames and his team developed this test at the end of the second half of the 20th century. At this period, it was innovative test. Now it remains a gold star for pharmaceutical, chemical, and cosmetic industry. This test is a reverse mutation. Mutation bacteria are cultivated overnight at 37 degrees and put in the contact with the substance to be stu studied in soft agar with low histidine with and without metabolization system. And then wall seed petri dishes incubated 48 to 72 hours in 30, 37 degrees, only mutated bacteria and return to wildlife grow. Thus, there are different kinds of MS tests, whose methodology has been adapted for different types of substance of quantity, depending on the quantity. You can see the result of calculation of sensitivity of sensitivity, of the specificity, accuracy, prediction of for positive or negative result for micro -EMS or nano -EMS. In this slide, you see, for example, standard M tests, we need about one gram of compounds. We can use treat and wash for natural or synthetic protein mixture, plant extract, antibiotics, or cytotoxic compounds, oncology. And we have also the EMS in fluctuation. This is MPF from Xenometrics. 
and managerization test in agar or in pre-incubation using NanoEMS uh, innovation from GenEvolution. A second GenEvolution innovation integrated in GLP study macronucleus is a specific staining of telomere and centromere. Halo increase the specificity of the test to differentiate a clastogenic effect chromosome break from anogenic effect lost of all part of a chromosome in a single GLP test or in a screening. Gen evolution reading has been used by semi-automated microscope. The third example of gen evolution innovation is to replace GEMSA by BMVC in CTA. BMVC is more specific marking of transformed FOC. This fluorescence property allows a quick quantification using the spectrometric evaluation. Indeed, the fluorescent properties of BMVC its specificity for transformed FOC allow this quantification. BMVC specially target guanidine quadruplex located in telomere. Telomere are degraded in, at each cell division after 20 days of culture. The BMVC signal is reduced. However, in cancer cells, a telomerase is synthesized and thus allows to restore the telomeres. We therefore observe an increase in BMVC signal as a function of increase in transformed focus. Caffeine was found negative and TPA, ester de forbol, was found positive with those effects. Thank you very much. If you have any question, do not hesitate to contact me at francis.finogenevolution.fr. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis, for your presentation about the genotoxicity assessment of cosmetic products. Our next speaker is Dr. Tim Lindberg, Key Account Manager at Sensagen. Sensagen has developed the GUARD test platform combining genomic data from human cells with machine learning for a unique capability to assess whether a chemical could cause allergic reactions on the skin or in the respiratory tract. Tim has a PhD in immunology from the University of Lund, during which he focused on the GUARD assay. Tim will now talk about the skin sensitization assessment of cosmetic products. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Lindberg key account manager at Sensien, and the aim of my presentation today is to provide an overview of established methods and new approach methodologies for the endpoint of skin sensitization. I would like to start the presentation with an introduction to the mechanisms of skin sensitization. It starts off with exposure to a foraging compound that penetrates the skin and interacts with endogenous proteins to form a haptin protein complex. This complex is then recognized by the dendritic cells and upon uptake and stimulation with inflammatory mediators, the disease become activated and migrates to a local lymph node. Here, they interact with allergen specific T cells and this concludes the first part of the skin sensitization reaction. Then upon re-exposure of the initial compound, the T cells proliferate and migrate to the site of exposure where they elicit an immune response that is clinically manifested as allergic contact dermatitis. The regulatory testing of the endpoint skin sensitization has traditionally been using in vivo tests such as LNA and guinea pig assays. However, Advancements during the last two decades have made available new approach methodologies, including several OECD accepted in vitro tests, applicable to testing of this endpoint. 
In a regulatory context, the in vitro assays aren't accepted as standalone alternatives to in vivo studies, but rather as a combination used in a defined approach. The mechanistic information of the skin sensitization reaction I showed you earlier had been summarized in what is called an adverse outcome pathway, which highlights the four most important key events for the development of skin sensitization. The in vitro methods for testing of skin sensitization have been based on this mechanistic information summarized in the AUP, where now the GOD assay is added to the accepted assays under key event 3, the dendritic cell activation. The OECD assays attributed to key event 3, the dendritic cell activation, is described in test guideline number 442E. The test in this guideline can be indiscriminately used to address requirements for test results of this endpoint. And data obtained supports discrimination between skin sensitizers and non sensitizers in an IARA. And depending on regulatory context, positive results may be used on their own to classify a chemical into UN GHS category 1. With the inclusion of the God skin, to the NAM-based assays in OECD test guideline 442, new opportunities arise for a broader array of chemicals to be tested. With a proven track record of the ability to accurately test difficult samples, such as lipophilic compounds and complex mixtures, the GOD assay fills data gaps and expands the applicability domain of chemicals possible to be tested. So now I would like to introduce you to how the GOD technology platform works. It is based on a dendritic cell-like cell line and therefore targets key event 3 in adverse outcome pathway for skin sensitization. And similarly to other assays, the GOD assay monitors how the cells react when they are exposed to external stimuli in the form of a sensitizer or non-sensitizer. But uniquely, not only a few biomarkers are monitored in the cellular response, but rather a holistic gene signature to see how the cells actually react to the external stimuli. The gene signature is then used in a machine learning algorithm called support vector machine to give a final classification. The readout of the algorithm is a decision value where a positive value corresponds to a skin sensitizing prediction and a negative classifies the compound as a non-sensitizer. To understand the relevance of measuring a larger set of biomarkers and how this is translated to immunological reactions, it is possible to look further into the identities of the genes in the guard skin prediction signature and map them to adverse outcome pathway for skin sensitization. This reveals that not only are the genes associated with the key event 3, but rather covers immunological reactions across all the key events in adverse outcome pathway and are therefore mechanistically relevant for the endpoint of skin sensitization. The GOD technology platform consists of several assays where the binary hazard identification assay, the GOD skin, is the one validated and accepted by the OECD. Here are some of the performance statistics and all validation studies are published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. As mentioned previously, the GOD skin assay adds to a broader applicability domain when testing in regulatory settings. However, other limitations faced by current accepted assays is the lack of potency information and continuous potency information, which is a critical component for risk assessing ingredients to be used in consumer products. To fill this gap, we have also provided in the GOD portfolio the GOD potency assay, which is a binary prediction of CLP classes 1A and 1B. The potency assay is currently in the test guideline program for formal validation into an OECD test guideline. Further, we have also developed the GOD skin dose response assay, which provides a quantitative assessment of skin sensitizing potency. And I will go further into this assay in my next slide. All of these assays are available in our laboratory in Lund in Sweden and can be performed under GLP requirements. In the conventional God skin assay, testing is performed at a single concentration and the readout is a decision value. In the God skin dose response assay, which is based on the validated protocols of the God skin assay, a concentration range of at least six concentrations is assayed in order to establish a dose response curve 
to identify the lowest concentration required to induce a positive classification in the prediction algorithm. This value is referred to the CDV0 value. We have demonstrated that this experimentally derived CDV0 concentration in the dose response assay is significantly correlated to both LNA EC3 and human NOEL values. To illustrate how the dose response assay are used in practice for potency predictions of unknown substances, I have here summarized the approach using the two chemicals, formaldehyde and resorcinol, as examples. The first step is dose response testing in God's skin dose response in order to identify the CDV0 concentration for each chemical. In the second step, the previously observed correlation between experimentally derived CDV0 values and LNA EC3 values can be used in order to predict a corresponding LNA EC3 for the unknown test item. These results can then be used, for example, uh, for CLP potency classifications or for potency ranking of potential candidate ingredients. But perhaps more useful, the predicted LNA EC3 values can be used in order to derive a nasal value that further can be used as a point of departure within already established procedures for quantitative risk assessment. The potential to use the dose response assay for potency prediction has been evaluated in a variety of studies across different industries. Here we see a collaboration together with IFF and RIFIM where the God skin dose response assay is used in a blinded study to evaluate accuracy and reproducibility. 36 chemicals were assayed where 24 were classified as sensitizers and corresponding nasal values for these 24 fragrance chemicals closely matched the reference data. 11 of the chemicals were further investigated for reproducibility and were shown to be highly reproducible with a median fold change of 2.5 between replicates. We are approaching the end of the presentation and I would like to summarize the most important take home messages related to the use of in vitro assays to the endpoint skin sensitization. For binary hazard identification and potency predictions, a few in vitro options are available, but generally they need to be used in a weight of evidence approach rather than standalone assays. Also important to consider is the applicability domain of each given assay, and it is up to the registrant to understand if the tested sample is applicable to the chosen assays. For quantitative assessment of skin sensitizing potency, fewer options are available and none have yet gained regulatory acceptance as standalone source of information. But some of the proposed strategies has demonstrated to be useful tools to determine the safe level of potential skin sensitizers to be used in consumer products. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for listening. And I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion during the Q&A session. Thank you, Tim, for your presentation about the skin sensitization assessment of cosmetic products. Our next speaker is Dr. Gregory Lemkin, director and founder of the Watchfrog Laboratory. For more than 15 years, the Watchfrog Laboratory has supported companies with their endocrine disrupting challenges. Their mission is to provide you with data which contributes towards the evaluation of your ingredients, products, packaging, and water samples. Gregory will now introduce us to the endocrine properties assessment of cosmetic products. Hello, my name is Gregory Lemkin. I'm the CEO of Watchfrog Laboratory, which is exclusively dedicated to endocrine disruptors. We have developed many alternative methods to assess the endocrine activity of chemicals, cosmetic ingredients and formulas. And in the past few years, we've been involved in many regulatory studies to assess the endocrine capacity of chemicals. We've learned a few lessons uh, on this assessment that I would like to share with you today. What is an endocrine disruptor? Well, first, let's remember that the hormonal system, our endocrine system, is controlling our major physiological functions. And of course, there are many things that can modulate our hormonal balance. The main difference with an endocrine disruptor is that the endocrine disruptor will cause a 
non-endocrine effect that will lead to an adverse outcome, a pathological effect. And that's what will distinguish an endocrine disruptor from an endocrine modulator. European Parliament adopted a definition that is actually taking into account this difference between an endocrine disruptor and an endocrine modulator. It's really based on the WHO definition of an exogenous substance or mixture that alters functions of the endocrine system and consequently causes adverse outcome. So this means that there are three criteria to define an endocrine disruptor. An endocrine specific mode of action that can involve a hormonal receptor or different mechanism upstream of the receptor such as the metabolism of, on the, of hormones. The adverse outcome, the pathological effect that can be observed on a whole organism, and also the possibility to establish a plausible link between this specific endocrine mode of action and the adverse outcome. And this is very important to define, to characterize an endocrine disruptor. You need a whole set of dat data that will uh, build this weight of evidence. Recently, European Commission proposed two new hazard class, uh, classes in the revision of the classification, labeling, and packaging regulation. The first class is the, the category one of known or presumed endocrine disruptors. This is for human health, but also exists for wildlife. This Full-blown endocrine disruptor are really defined by uh, data that com can come from human or animal data, or from both, and are really uh, defining close to the definition that was adopted by the Parliament, which means showing an endocrine activity, an adverse outcome, and the possibility to relate this adverse outcome to the endocrine activity. But the Commission took into account that there could be information that would raise doubts about the relevance of this data to establish this plausible link between activity and adversity. And in that case, they created a second category of hazard. So the first category really corresponds to the hazard labeling. Category two correspond to the suspicion of an endocrine disruption for human health or wildlife. Again, this category two uh, could be uh, relying on evidence from human or animal data. And we, we would, this data would show the, 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 the existence of endocrine activity and the possibility of adversity related to this endocrine activity. But in that case, the evidence for showing this endocrine activity or adversity is not sufficiently convincing to classify the substance in category one. And in that case, if there is a possible link between the endocrine activity and a possible adversity, then this classification in category two will lead to a warning uh, labeling of suspected endocrine disruption. The list of ma validated methods can be found in the OECD guidance document 150, which covers between 40 to 50 different methods, including mammalian and non-mammalian methods, and of course also including in vitro cellular assays or methods on uh, whole organisms on full life cycles of whole organisms. At Watchfrog, we've always been focused on the uh, level three, which gave us the possibility to develop alternative methods on early stage of aquatic embryos, which are compliant with cosmetic regulation, but also provides the highest weight of evidence that can be achieved for the assessment of cosmetic ingredients. 
we've developed these different methods covering the EATS, estrogens, androgens, pyrid steroidogenesis, which are the main required uh, for regulatory assessment because these are the hormonal pathways for which we have criteria of adversity, which, as you've understood, are required to determine whether it's an hormonal modulator or full-blown endocrine disruptor. So to build this weight of evidence, we can combine different methods, uh, including cellular models to elucidate mechanism. Of course, the early stage of aquatic embryos I've just mentioned, and of course, laboratory animals that are not uh, to be used for cosmetic assessment, but existing data of these models can be very useful to build this weight of evidence. We have developed these alternative methods on early stages of aquatic embryos because they are both ethical and physiologically relevant. These early stages are defined as ulterior embryos because they depend on their egg reserves, their yolk, to develop. These early stages are non-sentient stages, which complied with, with the requirements of European regulation to replace the use of laboratory animals. And NGOs, protecting animals, have already expressed their interest for these solutions to progressively reduce and replace the use of laboratory animals. These in vitro early stage of whole organisms are very useful because as stated by the SCCS in its guidance, the gonadotrophic axis and the pituitary thyroid axis between these aquatic embryos and the mammalian models is very, very well conserved. This is why these models are very useful to assess endocrine activity both for non-mammalian and mammalian models. Watchfrog has developed different methods that have been published and validated by OECD. The first of these methods is the OECD Test Guideline 248, also known as the XETA assay. In this test, we use the criteria of amphibian metamorphosis, which is exclusively dependent on thyroid signaling. In the tadpoles, the fluorescence is revealing the capacity of the test item to induce or repress the thyroid signaling in its capacity to control the morphogenetic program of metamorphosis. In the test guideline 251, the radar assay, we use the fluorescence again to reveal the capacity of the test item to induce or repress the androgenic signaling. And similarly, in the reactive assay, in the fish fry, the fluorescence in the liver is revealing the capacity of the test item to induce or repress estrogenic signaling, which is known to control egg production, egg production in fish. With these two models, estrogenic and androgenic, we also reveal the capacity of the test item to affect steroidogenesis, which is the metabolic capacity to produce estrogens and androgens. By using these alternative methods for regulatory assessment of endocrine chemicals, we've learned a few lessons, but I think the most important one is that to avoid classification in category one or in category two as, as a suspected endocrine chemical, you really need to show that your test item has no endocrine activity. And to do so, you need to cover all the mechanisms, which is doable by uh, using these embryonic methods that are covering the different modes of action, the different mechanisms of the hormonal pathways. But also, as I said, the use of these early stages of aquatic embryo provides a technically reasonable alternative ethical solution to provide this data. More importantly, as these methods are physiologically relevant, they limit the risk of false positive and false negatives in the data set. And to achieve 
a conclusive data set, we must keep in mind that it's also very important to combine different test methods and different data sets, both in vitro and in vivo, in vitro for the mechanistic approach, in vivo when it's possible to access these data set on mammals or non-mammalian data and combine it with uh, also the knowledge of modes of action to achieve a conclusive data set requires an expertise on endocrine disruption. I'd like to thank my colleague Barbara Robin Duchesne who helped me to prepare this presentation and uh, I'll be happy to follow up with your questions. Thank you, Grégory, for your presentation about the endocrine properties assessment of cosmetic products. Our final speaker today is Dr. Hanan Osman Ponchet, director and founder of Picaderm. The Picaderm Laboratory offers innovative solutions for in vitro safety and efficacy testing of products likely to come into contact with the skin. The Picaderm team offers support in every phase of the product development lifecycle in the area of dermatology, cosmetics, pharmaceutical, medical device, chemical, agrochemical, and textile. Hanan will now talk about the efficacy assessment of cosmetic ingredients and cosmetic products. Thank you, Anna, for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Osman ponchet uh, and uh, I am very happy to be there at uh, this webinar uh, to present uh, the efficacy assessment of uh, cosmetics. Uh, and uh, I hope this presentation will be uh, useful for the audience. So uh, why uh, should cosmetics uh, be tested? Uh, in fact, uh, uh, in addition to being safe, uh, cosmetic products uh, are required to be effective when used by a consumer. Uh, we need, in fact, uh, to protect uh, uh, consumers from misleading claims. Uh, and also, uh, we need to be in line uh, with uh, uh, the regulation. Uh, as you know, the European Cosmetic Regulation clearly states uh, that uh, claims for cosmetic products uh, shall be supported by adequate uh, and uh, verifiable evidence, uh, regardless of the types of uh, evidential support uh, used to substantiate them. And uh, also, uh, you know, today uh, in China and also the FDA are uh, working uh, to, uh, to, to, uh, to issue uh, new uh, guidelines regarding uh, the claims of uh, cosmetic products. Uh, and as the seventh amendment to the European Cosmetic Directive has banned the use of animals for testing of cosmetics, many alternatives to animal testing have been developed and validated for efficacy testing of cosmetics to support uh, cosmetic claim substantiation. And uh, as you know, uh, the European Union has banned the sale of any cosmetic product or uh, ingredient that have been tested on animals uh, since 2013. There are uh, many in vitro models uh, that can be used for efficacy testing. Uh, the 2D models like uh, keratinocytes uh, uh, and uh, fibroblasts, uh, the 3D models like reconstructed human epidermis or uh, full thickness uh, uh, 3D models, uh, and uh, the gold standard, uh, the human skin explant. And according to the stage of uh, the development, uh, we can use either the 2D model or the 3D model. And uh, the limitation of using uh, 2D uh, models uh, is we need uh, that uh, the test uh, item uh, be soluble in the culture medium. Uh, that means that when uh, we uh, evaluate uh, finished uh, product like a cream or a gel, we cannot use uh, the 2D models. Uh, we, uh, we do uh, use uh, the 3D models or the skin explant. And now I'm going to show you a case study regarding the uh, anti-inflammatory property. 
so uh, if my ingredients are uh, have an anti-inflammatory property, so what claims uh, can uh, can I can I make? Uh, one of the claims is uh, can be reducing redness and irritation, uh, calming and soothing inflamed skin, or uh, improving the overall appearance of inflamed skin, or it contains anti-inflammatory ingredients, or uh, it is spe specifically formulated for sensitive uh, or uh, inflamed skin. Of course, uh, uh, we cannot uh, claim that uh, my ingredient or my product uh, can treat uh, the inflammation, and that is what uh, the, and that is uh, the difference between uh, the claim of a cosmetic product uh, and the claim of a drug. So uh, how uh, can we model uh, skin inflammation? In fact, we can use both uh, 2D human uh, epidermal keratinocyte uh, or uh, 3D human uh, skin equivalent. And uh, we can uh, model either uh, the acute inflammation by uh, stimulation with uh, UV irradiation or uh, lipopolysaccharide, or uh, uh, we can uh, model also the chronic inflammation uh, like, the, uh, at, in, like in the case of atopic dermatitis. And uh, for this, uh, we, sim we stimulate uh, the, the system uh, with uh, a cocktail of uh, cytokine. So uh, briefly, regarding the experimental uh, procedure, uh, we treat uh, a keratinocyte or a 3D uh, skin model for uh, 24 uh, or 48 hours. And then uh, we measure uh, cell viability uh, by uh, LDH or MTTSA. Uh, we can measure uh, cytokines uh, secreted in culture medium by ELISA. And also we measure uh, the mRNA expression of cytokine uh, and uh, some markers of uh, barrier functions like uh, involucrine, lorecrine, and filigrine. So uh, here you can see uh, an example of uh, the effect of UVB irradiation uh, on uh, IL-8 and uh, TNF-alpha uh, level. And you can clearly see that uh, UVB uh, induce a, a significant increase of uh, these two inflammatory markers uh, and uh, this validate uh, the assay and uh, from this result uh, you can test uh, your uh, ingredient or your product uh, either uh, before uh, UVB irradiation or after uh, UVB irradiation in order to see if uh, the level of uh, inflammatory markers uh, can be reduced. And here is uh, the example of uh, uh, acute inflammation uh, induced by uh, lipopolysaccharide. And you can see that uh, LPS uh, induce increase of IL-8 uh, in both uh, uh, 2D model and uh, 3D model. And uh, the treatment uh, with uh, corticoid like dexamethasone or uh, a topical treatment uh, with betamethasone uh, clearly reduce uh, this uh, inflammation. And uh, here is uh, another example uh, of uh, chronic uh, inflammation induced by a cocktail of uh, cytokine uh, mimicking uh, atopic dermatitis. And you can clearly uh, see that uh, the cytokine cocktail reduces the expression of uh, filagrine and involucrine, uh, two markers of uh, barrier function. And uh, the, the treatment uh, with the uh, JAK inhibitor, uh, uh, a new generation of, uh, uh, of uh, atopic dermatitis uh, treatment can uh, clearly reverse the effect of uh, uh, cytokine cocktail. 
And uh, a concrete example of uh, testing of cosmetic product using this in vitro uh, model to evaluate the anti-inflammatory properties. Uh, here we tested the finished product, uh, product X, in the model uh, stimulated with LPS. And uh, as we can see, that the product is X uh, show a strong anti-inflammatory properties at, as it reduces the level of TNF-alpha and IL-8. And we can also uh, notice that the product uh, X uh, is better than the corticoid dexamethasone in this model. So you can, uh, we can clearly claim that uh, the product X uh, can be used to, uh, to soothe or to calm uh, inflammation or inflamed skin, or uh, the product X uh, contains an anti-inflammatory uh, ingredient. Another uh, case uh, study is uh, regarding the wound healing uh, property. Uh, so what claims uh, can, be, uh, can be done uh, regarding this property? Uh, one of the claims is uh, uh, it promotes uh, healing of damaged skin or it speeds up uh, the healing process of cuts, scraps and burns or it promotes the growth of new skin cells, it reduces scarring, it promotes collagen production, it contains wound healing ingredients, or it is specifically formulated for wound care and the post-surgery recovery. So the in vitro model of wound healing, or also called a scratch test, is a simple, versatile, and cost-effective method to study cell migration and wound healing. The technique involves making a scratch or a wound in a confluent monolayer, and then doing live cell imaging using time-lapse microscopy and uh, finally, uh, measurement of uh, cell migration. And uh, here uh, is uh, rapidly the workflow of uh, wound healing uh, assay. We, uh, we cultivate uh, cells in uh, EBT culture insert uh, to, to make reproducible uh, wound. And then uh, using the Cytosmart uh, uh, Omni device, uh, we can make uh, time-lapse uh, images. Uh, and then uh, we, uh, we measure uh, the, 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 the kinetic of wound healing and uh, cell migration. And uh, here is an example of uh, results of wound healing assay. And we can see the, uh, that uh, when we compare the migration rate, uh, we, uh, we can uh, show that product two or the ingredient two uh, accelerate uh, the cell migration and wound healing, whereas product one uh, has uh, no effect uh, on the cell migration. And uh, the, the final uh, case study uh, is regarding uh, dermal absorption. So uh, what claims uh, can be do uh, regarding uh, this uh, essay? Uh, one of the claims is uh, it delivers active ingredients uh, to the deeper layers of the skin where they can be more effective or uh, it is specifically formulated for deep penetration and optimal results or it promotes collagen production, or it contains ingredients that are able to penetrate deep into the skin. And uh, here is an example of uh, dermal absorption uh, results. Uh, we can uh, clearly see that uh, the ingredient X uh, is distributed in the stratum corneum, in the epidermis, uh, the dermis, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent in the receptor uh, liquid. And uh, so the results clearly show that uh, the ingredient is delivered in, uh, to the deeper layers of the skin. 
So uh, to summarize, uh, uh, different in vitro models exist uh, for efficacy evaluation of cosmetic products uh, and cosmetic ingredients. Uh, each model has advantages uh, and inconvenience, uh, and uh, we need to choose uh, the right model at the right time uh, to support uh, cosmetic uh, claims. And uh, I would like uh, to thank you very much uh, for your uh, listening. And uh, please uh, do not hesitate uh, to, uh, to ask a question uh, or uh, even uh, you can send uh, an email. Thank you very much.